Welcome to Chapter 21, An Emerging World Power, 1890 to 1918. Well, let's get started. So, where did it go from expansionism to what historians will call imperialism? First, many sought overseas markets to improve the United States economy. It's one reason to expand, but how does that become imperialism? There are two books to know. Um, if you ever write an essay about imperialism, don't get nervous. I'm not going to have you do one yet, or might not at all. Um, there's two books here. Our Country by Hosea Strong, which advocated for the spread of Christianity overseas. And you read in your textbook about um, the missionary, uh, definitely to China, trying to spread uh, Christianity um, to different races in different places. Didn't mean to rhyme on that. The Influence of Sea Power Upon History by Alfred T. Mahon. Very, very, very influential on United States foreign policy, where he believed that naval power was a key to strong empires. Remember back then, guys, armies with guns, bayonets, not quite into mm, grenades and huge explosives, of course, cannon, that kind of stuff. Uh, the munitions quite were, aren't where they were in the 20th century. There were no nuclear weapons. There were no airplanes. So if you really think about it, the might in a military would be your navy. That's where you, if you can control the seas, okay, you can protect your economic interests. You can also protect your overall foreign policy interests and um, economic and strategic geopolitical um, strategy is all interrelated. Um, they say it's all about money, and in essence, it is true. So if you're looking to expand markets overseas, you need a navy to protect it. That is Mayan's thesis. And so therefore, he encouraged the United States to build a new modern navy made out of steel-hulled ships, not the old wooden clipper ships that they had. Not that they weren't good for their time, but definitely outdated because the Germans and the British and others were starting to build those steel hull battleships and destroyers and those class of uh, naval vessels, and he advocated for the same. What were some other arguments for expansion? American exceptionalism, the belief that the U.S. should always help spread democracy and spread its civilization. And belief that the frontier was closed. And remember Jackson's thesis. So we have the War of 1898. What were the causes? The Spanish placed Cubans in concentration camps. And General Whaler was nicknamed by the American press and others the Butcher. Yellow journalism was where newspapers exaggerated stories to sell those papers. So they made Whaler look like this butcher. I mean, he did some tough things. Uh, um, when they're, when you're trying to control a population, unfortunately, uh, those that are occupying will do some pretty rough stuff. But the yellow journalism exaggerated and made uh, Whaler into this monster. Also what happened there... Um, was the USS Maine was there in the Havana port to take some um, students and other people out of Cuba and take them out of there because of what was going on in this um, civil war between, not the civil war, but this um, uprising, the Cubans and the Spanish. Um, the U.S. ship mysteriously exploded. And the press and many Americans blamed the Spanish. We now know that it exploded itself where there were munitions down in the hull right next to where the, the, the boiler room where they were firing up the engines. There must have been some sort of spark or something that caused it to blow up. Then, of course, there was the DeLome letter that you read about where um, the Spanish foreign minister, in a letter to um, someone else, Trash talked President McKinley and basically said that he was a politician. He went where the wind blew. 
He's trying to make everybody happy, but at the same time trying to um, satisfy the jingos in his party. Jingos are people that want to go to war. You're warmongers, I guess would be the modern term of jingos. It's not meant to be a flattering term. It's meant to be a very unflattering term. So McKinley was put in a cor corner. If he didn't do anything, he was weak. But at the same time, it took him a little bit while while longer to weigh that. Because um, his inkling at first was not to go to war, but he was basically pushed into it. Not to take... Not to take blame away from him, I'm just saying. So what were the effects of the war first? The U.S. will win in four months. And let's be real, the Sp Spain at the time was declining over the past 100 years at least, if not 200 years. The Spanish Empire with its glory in the you know, 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, since the Spanish Armada was defeated in, in, British, in the English Channel, um... That was the start of the decline of the Spanish Empire. So when it, beating them in four months, it was it was a foe in the Western Hemisphere um, that um, wasn't necessarily that big of a deal for the United States to defeat. Um, once they defeated um, the Spanish, the U.S. promised independence to Cuba after the war. This is known as the Teller Amendment that was passed in the Senate. Um, they're not really going to keep that promise. And in the Treaty of Paris that ended the War of 1898, or the Spanish-American War, the U.S. is going to gain Guam, Cuba, yes, Guam does exist, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Some serious strategic territories, too particularly Puerto Rico, the Philippines. So there's going to be a debate over the Philippines. What McKinley is basically going to do is annex it, make it part of the United States territories, which wasn't the promise that was understood by the Filipino people. Um, a group called the Anti-Imperialist League, like Mark Twain, Jane Addams, Samuel Gompers, and others spoke out against the acquisition of territories. Then you have a, a person named Emilio Aguinaldo. I think that's how it's pronounced. If I pronounce it wrong, my apologies. He led a rebellion in the Philippines against the U.S. He basically said, wait a minute here. I thought you guys were going to liberate us. You got the Spanish out of there. And now you're here. And now you're trying to do the same thing that the Spanish did. So there was a rebellion against the U.S. But eventually... Eventually, many years later, on July 4th, the 4th of July, that's not by accident, in 1946, after World War II, the Philippines will gain their independence from the United States. The United States will no longer have them as an annexed territory. But understand that this, this conflict in the Philippines, where the Philippines were rebelling against the United States, a lot of U.S. soldiers were sent there. And it was very, very, very hotly debated in the United States between your imperialists and the anti-imperialists. And one of the biggest, biggest uh, detractors was Mark Twain. And in your readings, you have some of the writings of Twain against this imperialism where he said at first, look, uh, I thought I was for it. You know, we defeat Spain and we're going to we're going to be liberators. We're going to liberate these lands for this for the Filipinos. Well, we didn't. We went to occupy them and have it as a strategic point, and we sought out to have control of the Philippines. So he became an anti-imperialist right after that, because he thought at first the United States would be nice about it. They're, they're defeating people in countries to liberate people, but that wasn't the case. Now, basically, the, the, um, the criticism of the Philippine, Philippine campaign is we're being the same as the Europeans. We're no different. And we shouldn't be doing that. Um, if you look at the Philippines, it's the last time the United States, that and Puerto Rico, since the experience after the War of 1898 or the Spanish-American War, the United States' heavy-handed tactics in those two areas will never be replicated again in an occupation of a country after a war. 
Yes, we occupied Japan and part of Germany, but we tried to rebuild them. Democracy, you know, parliamentary style, unitary style, um, capitalism. We tried to rebuild them pretty much. We gave them the choice and our own image of free elections, free democratic governments and that kind of stuff. No more of this occupation stuff like the Philippines. Um, even uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, the way it was occupied was always done with um, people on the ground and trying not to be heavy handed. And you can argue that's why Afghanistan and Iraq was not successful. I mean, you can, we can go on debating about that. But the way the United States would deal with occupied territories in the future will change because of the experience and the debate and the disagreement with how the Philippines were handled. That's that's my point. And take note of that as we go forward in American history. So the United States will emerge a power among powers. Their defeat of Spain and acquisition of territories is going to put them in a different place. First, the open door in Asia. Secretary of State John Hay under Theodore Roosevelt um, had these open door notes where he sought opportunity for all countries to have access to trade in China. Okay, um, Secretary of State John Hay was Abraham Lincoln's secretary, regular secretary, executive secretary when he was president. So Hay was has been around for a long time. Okay, but these open door notes was put there because basically the British, the Germans. The Russians had exclusive rights to trade with China. And the trade with China was pretty, lack of a better term, oppressive. China was weakened politically. They were a disaster. And the European powers took advantage of them. And the textbook illustrates that pretty well. Um, well, the United States wanted to get in on the party too. They wanted to trade, make some money. Um, also, there were some other folks that wanted to send missionaries there to try to convert the Chinese, convert Chinese to Christianity. And as you know, today in the United States and in China and the world, there are a good amount of a good number of Chinese uh, Christians. Then the Russo-Japanese Russo War, excuse my pronunciation, of 1905, um, Russia and Japan. Basically, what happened? There was a huge naval battle, and Japan basically destroyed the Russian fleet, embarrassed the Russians bad. The Japanese were beating the Russians really bad in this war. It was mostly on the seas, and uh, Russia was completely, completely outmatched. So Teddy Roosevelt is going to mediate um, a peace agreement between the Russians and the Japanese. Um, he understanding that Japan is becoming an emerging world power, um, Teddy Roosevelt didn't want to mediate this peace out of the goodness of his heart. He wanted to mediate it looking forward and wanted to send a message to the Japanese um, about where the United States was. Um, with this root uh, uh, Takahira agreement, the U.S. recognized Japan's jurisdiction in Manchuria. But before that, let me go back. The end of this war, you need to write this down. I don't have it here, which I'll have to fix for the future. The name of the treaty that ends the Russo-Japanese War is the Treaty of Portsmouth. Again, that's the Treaty of Portsmouth. Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was the place where the Russians and the Japanese came um, for negotiations and where this meeting, this agreement was hammered out. Um, the Japanese pretty much got what they wanted for the most part. Um, the reason why Roosevelt wanted it in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, that's where the big naval yard was, where this new steel navy was being built, influenced by Mahan and Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt and Mahan were friends. Uh, Roosevelt, quite a few times, would, went to Newport before he was president to visit his friend Al Mahan. And they, because Roosevelt wrote a book or two about the U.S. Navy. So he wanted to show the Japanese specifically and put them on notice that a new and improved American Navy is coming to a theater near you. So he didn't do this all by the goodness of his heart. Again, I'm repeating myself. He did this to send a message to Japan. He saw that Japan and the United States were going to war within 20 to 30 years. He was about 10 years off. 10 years, 10 years more. 
1941, obviously, is when the U.S. and Japan will go to war. So he saw this as the emergent power and threat in the Pacific, and that's why he stepped in. Uh, Roosevelt will also get the Nobel Peace Prize for mediating the Treaty of Portsmouth in 1905, the first American to get that. And then again, the root uh, Takahira agreement where the United States recognized Japan's jurisdiction in Manchuria, which is part of China, that they could have um, influence there, ceding some ground to the Japanese because of their power in, in the Far East. Um, that will change over time. So the United States and Latin America so it was shipped from Asia to Latin America and in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, under Roosevelt, you had this big stick diplomacy, this old African proverb of speak softly and carry a big stick. Under Roosevelt, the United States will use its navy, if necessary, to protect its interests in the Western Hemisphere. So what that is, is an expansion of the Monroe Doctrine. You remember the Monroe Doctrine from US 1? Um where the United States basically said to Europe, you stay out of the Western Hemisphere, that's our playground, Latin America, Central America, and the Americas, and then we, the United States, will stay out of the affairs of Europe. Deal? Because the United States did not want European powers inserting its influence in the Western Hemisphere. It was seen as a strategic threat to the United States because the one thing they didn't want to see again is any of these countries like France previously or Spain or others try to claim lands in North America in particular. But also, as the United States economy is expanding and wanting to trade, one of the easiest partners for them to trade with would be Latin America. It's a short trip, and they'll be able to have some pretty heavy influence on those countries that would be advantageous to American trade. So it will get more to what's called dollar diplomacy, but right now it's big stick diplomacy. This new Navy that's being built, TR is saying to the world, uh, be careful here because I will use the Navy. And also the United States wanted to have a canal to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and eventually they're going to gain authorization to build the canal controlled and controlled it for the entire 20th century. Now, the Panama Canal story, um, originally, um, Colombia uh, controlled that area, which is today known as Panama. There was a French company that tried to build the canal. They failed. They ran out of money. So the United States bought the rights to that, but the Colombians didn't want to cooperate you know with the land acquisition necessary to complete the canal so what did roosevelt do he went to the panamanians they basically backed a rebellion against the colombians kicked the colombians out defeated them in a rebellion in panama and then when panama got control they signed over a lease to the united states to build the canal so basically we forced our will down there by supporting a rebellion against the Colombians to get control of the area um, to be able to build this canal. It was strategically critical, 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 critical um, for U.S. trade and military operations to have a canal that goes through Central America so you can get from the Atlantic to the Pacific Theater. So this overall policy is looked at as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. That means an addition or change to it. It's an extension of the Monroe Doctrine where the U.S. could intervene in Latin American affairs and the U.S. became a police power in Latin America by using the Navy and the, the military. Okay? So if you look at speak softly, carry a big stick, the Navy can be used. You know what? We need a canal here because we need to be able to move for trade from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Remember, most of U.S. manufacturing was on the East Coast. They wanted to get it to the Pacific. Instead of going all the way around South America, now they have this canal they're going to be building. So now that's even going to push the United States' influence even stronger. Now it becomes this corollary where they're extending that Monroe Doctrine, that the U.S. has the right and can intervene in Latin America and essentially become a police power in Latin America against the rest of the world. Not against, well, I guess so. There'll be some revolutions in Mexico. Beginning in 1911, Mexico went through a series of leaders. Basket case. I mean, 
it's unfortunate. Mexico politically has been in real tough shape for a long time. You can even argue right now they're in tough shape where a lot of these drug cartels control the government. So uh, Mexico has had their issues for a long time. Woodrow Wilson, who gets elected president in 1912 and starts serving in 1913, became caught in the middle through his support and opposition of various leaders. So even to go back to this with Wilson, which isn't here, you have um, what's known as missionary diplomacy. Missionary diplomacy under Wilson is that the United States is the moral authority in Latin America. That the reason we intervene is if if uh, countries in Latin America are not being democratic or fair to its people. That's missionary diplomacy. Um, between T.R. and Wilson is going to be William Howard Taft. The diplomacy during his presidency is being known as dollar diplomacy. That the United States military will intervene when America's financial interests are in danger in the in uh, uh, Latin America. I was about to say Middle East in Latin America, because banks and companies are in, are going to invest heavily in Latin American countries. Well, if their governments are a disaster, or whatever, or threatening American businesses. American troops will be sent into those countries to protect the financial interests, the banks, and the investments of these United States companies. That's dollar diplomacy. So you have big stick diplomacy, okay, under Roosevelt. You have dollar diplomacy under Taft. You have missionary diplomacy or moral diplomacy under Wilson. Under Wilson's more about democracy for people, that people have their say that people in those countries have their say. And when there's a dictatorship that's oppressive to its people, the United States will intervene. So the United States is going to end up getting involved in World War I. What were the causes of World War I? You know this acronym, MAIN, M-A-I-N. Militarism, the alliance system, or alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Okay, so militarism, a lot of the countries in Europe were building huge armies. The Germans, the Russians, even the French were all armed up. The British with their navy, and were, they're all um, um, gearing up for whatever. They haven't had a war in a long time. This is 1914. The alliance system. I will show you in class. We'll look at the alliance system real quick um, where you have the British and the French. And the Russians allied on one side, and then you have the Germans, Aust- Austrian, Hungarians, and a little more minorly, the Italians on another side, and the Ottomans also. So, what's going to end up happening is these alliance systems, once there's a spark, is going to be mobilized where these, these countries are going to support their allies as they mobilize for war. Imperialism, if you look at the British, if you look at the French. Of the Germans, even the Austrian Hungarians in Eastern Europe, their influence in different parts of the world. And as rivals against each other, as these powerful nations, is going to influence the cause of the First World War. And then nationalism, where all the countries are looking at, um, they want their countries to be dominant. They have this uh, national pride. You add militarism to that, um, you know. People were just itching for war. What was the spark? A guy um, assassinated. An an Albanian national um, is going to um, assassinate um, Archduke Ferdinand, who was the the heir to the Austrian-Hungarian throne while he was in Sarajevo in Yugoslavia. And um, that's going to get the Austrian-Hungarians to put an ultimatum ultimatum on uh, the folks... Um, in that country, well, then Russia's going to come to their defense, and then Germany's going to step in, and then France is going to step in, and it's going to put off, off a series of events that is going to cause this war to start. The U.S. sought neutrality first, as was said by um, Wilson, neutral in fact as well as in name. The United States really sought neutrality. 
And if you go all the way back to George Washington in his in his farewell address, warning against entangling alliances in Europe, as always was the thought of the United States, is to stay the heck out of this powder keg in Europe. We're far enough away. We got a big ocean away from the Atlantic. We can stay out of this. But the reality is, guys, what the United States now is an economic power that's on the world stage with all the major powers. To say that they're going to be able to stay neutral in this conflict was wishful thinking. So there was a struggle to remain neutral. The U.S. traded more with the Allies than the Central Powers. Also, guys, um, the United States felt an affinity to England. We shared the same uh, language and the same history and part of the same culture. So the Allies in Britain, would you would see, would tend to be more of our natural ally. And yes, we did trade with them more. Um, Germany's policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, where they sunk the Lusitania on May 7th of 1915. Um, they made this pledge, it's known as a Sussex Pledge, where they promised not to sink merchant and passenger ships without a warning. But here was the deal, guys. It's real simple. The British Navy was extremely powerful. They blockaded the Germans. They're trying to starve them out. They blockaded the, the, the Atlantic, the North Atlantic. The Germans were becoming desperate. And it was true. The United States was secretly supporting um, the British with supplies and everything else. Uh, the Lusitania had munitions from the, on there. They were training munitions with the United States. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So then there's going to be the Zimmerman telegram where Germany will encourage Mexico to attack the United States. In return, what they would do is help the Mexico get back the lands they lost in the Mexican-American War. That means California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, the Germans will get that back for them. Well, that came public and the, the American public became really angry. So let me go back to that so you can see that for a second. You can pause it. Promise Mexico to regain land lost to the U.S. in the Mexican-American War if they supported attacking the United States. They wanted the United States distracted. They did. The Germans did not want the United States to enter the war because at that time, the Russians were, were leaving the war. They were leaving the war and taking away that eastern front that the Germans had to worry about. So the last thing the Germans wanted was the Americans to come and take their place. The reason the Russians left the war is because of the Communist Revolution, the Red Revolution in, um, in uh, Russia, where the, the Tsar and his family were, um, were executed and started a new communist government, uh, the Soviet government, the Soviet Union. Um, and one of their big, big, big things with the Soviets is not to be involved in foreign wars, to spend its time on building um, the communities in their country, not fighting a war overseas. So they pulled out of World War I. So it makes sense. The Germans are going to try to keep the Americans occupied on Mexico than being occupied on Europe. It was a gamble for the uh, Germans. It didn't really work out. So over there, the Americans will join the war. Congress instituted conscription, which is a fancy word for the draft. And what they're going to draft is men to make the American Expeditionary Force, or the AEF. The U.S. will join the fight in 1917. They'll declare war in early 1917. The Congress will declare war with Wilson's uh, urging. But they won't start putting their first troops into Europe until six months later. They have to build the army. They have to drill them. They have to train them. You can't just... And to take... A million men, or whatever how many it is, and to transport them, this is before airplanes, guys, on boats with supplies and munitions and you name it, is a major, 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 major logistical undertaking. I want you to sit back for a minute and think about that. How much effort and supplies and logistics it would take to move a massive army of folks on boats. It's the only way they're getting there. It's a massive undertaking. Especially you add in the German submarines or U-boats that are trying to take everybody out. So now you have to make these convoys. You need a bunch of ships. It's a lot of stuff. You're not going to do it with the snap of a finger overnight. It took about six months. 
As I already talked about the Bolshevik Revolution where Russia became communist and withdrew from the war. And eventually the American might, the numbers of Americans, and they actually went in the battle and they did pretty well. They surprised their European allies. They thought the Americans would just be like, ah, they'll be bodies, but they're not going to be that good. They actually proved to be pretty good fighters and pretty uh, pretty good. They had some real successful battles. Um, but the American numbers and the industrial output of the United States with feeding, they fed Europe. Free Europe was fed, not free Europe, but Europe was basically fed by the United States. Herbert Hoover was the administrator of the food program that went to Europe. So it was American industrialization and American farming and American numbers that tipped the scale for the Allies. It would be even more so um, the United States industrial output for World War II. So the American fighting force, 4 million men were in the military during World War I. 10% of them were African American. And my math tells me 400,000. Right? They fought in segregated units, excluded from the victory parade in Paris. That's nice. Thanks, but no thanks. Also, right at the end of the war, right after the war, in 1918 to 1919, a absolutely devastating influenza epidemic hit the world. 50 million people worldwide died. In the United States, and probably, in, I don't know how many there were. I think there was at least a million people in the United States killed by the flu. Influenza. Awful, 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 awful. So... War on the home front, mobilizing the economy. Okay, there's Hoover, Hoover down there. Um, the War Industries Board helped direct production for the military. They basically took control of many aspects of the economy to make sure that there was enough production for the war effort. The Naval War Labor Board was in the eight-hour workday for war workers in overtime. And who was the Assistant Secretary of Navy then? Another Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time in the Wilson administration. He worked with the unions with the eight-hour workday for war workers and overtime, and guess what? It kept them from striking. That was the big thing. They, remember, before World War I, strikes were happening left and right because labor was getting fed up of you know, how they were being treated in the whole labor arrangement. Well, when the war came in, they said, look, we'll agree to the AR workday, we'll pay for overtime. Um, and that kept them working and kept the ships being made and kept uh, the munitions and all everything else being made, the wagons, you name it. Many un unions, again, I just said, promised not to strike. Then you had the Food Administration that I already mentioned, but with Herbert Hoover relied on volunteerism to promote the war effort. But basically, the Food Administration fed the world with grain enough so people in Europe did not starve out. And that was very, very, very profitable for farmers. Farmers did very, very well during World War I as they were able to sell all their surplus over to go to Europe and they made good money. That's pretty much a short period of time from before then right after the 1920s, the farmers are going to start getting hit again. So some propaganda promoting national unity, this group called, well, government agency known as the Committee on Public Information, known as the Creel Committee, or CPI, led by George Creel and the Four Minute Men. And who are these Four Minute Men? They went to people all around the country, to meetings and stuff, and, and in four minutes would give a speech to promote the war effort on the home front, asking people to buy war bonds, asking people to make sure they support the war. Some of the ugliness, one of the reasons, as I told you, I don't like Woodrow Wilson, which would be the Sedition Act of 1918, it made it illegal to criticize the war effort. Let that sink in. Illegal to criticize the war effort. Who has a problem with that? I do. It's called the First Amendment. So, um, and it was upheld by uh, Schenck versus the United States, the Supreme Court decision. They upheld this, saying it was, you know, 
It was so important to the war effort that we silence people that criticize it. I, I don't know about you guys. I have a problem with it. I could even. I would have a problem with it. Let's just say I supported our intervention in World War One. I. I would still have a problem with it making it illegal to criticize it. Like I supported uh, the the invasion of Iraq. I thought it was necessary for a lot of reasons. Well, a lot of my friends, a lot of folks here didn't. They had the right to speak out against it. I think it's healthy for our our republic. I think it's healthy for our country. Um, when things are made illegal to criticize a war effort. That's a little scary to me. Just that's just me. Now their concerns were there were a lot of German Americans. Okay, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Germans immigrated to the United States. They're afraid that this criticizing the war effort would get German Americans to rise up, and now you all have the war expanded to the United States. That's what they said. I don't know. I I, I just I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not buying. Well, I'm not saying I'm not buying because I don't think they were trying to lie about it. I think they believe that. I just don't agree. The other thing to remember too, guys, when you go back to under the Sedition Act, there were a lot of folks that were thrown into jail, and their writ of habeas corpus was suspended. People like Eugene V. Debs jailed under the Sedition Act, but a lot of these folks were put in jail with no charges put against them for a while. This is the dark and ugly stuff of, of the Wilson administration during World War One that we really don't uh, talk about here. So, And look at some of these posters. Look at the one on the right. Destroy this mad brute and list. That's supposed to be the Kaiser of Germany. Okay. Um, Persons cr Crusaders, if you're going to, you know, Support the war effort. It's like supporting the Crusades. So, some of the imagery here, some of these posters, these World War One uh, propaganda posters are really, really good. So are the World War Two ones. If you're into art, propaganda art, there's some really good stuff here. The war on the home front too. You had these great migrations of African Americans that, lack of a better term, escaped the South to the northern cities. Where are they going to northern cities for? They're getting away from sharecropping. Um, in that life, and going to the northern factories that were making uh, weapons and munitions and stuff for the war effort. So they're going up there to take jobs in New York City, Chicago, and St. Louis. And when men came back after the war at the end of uh, 1918, they're coming back in early 1919, a lot of these white guys are coming back to their cities and their jobs are filled by African Americans. Well, guess what? It's going to turn into race riots in northern cities. This is an unfortunate reality at the time. Um, at the end of World War One. the same thing's going to happen at the end of World War Two. Is that a lot of times ugliness, racial ugliness, will come out in tough economic times when people believe that their livelihoods are threatened. You had men coming back from World War One, There were no jobs to be had. The economy is going to go into tank for about three years. There's going to be a massive recession from that. So people are going to be desperate for jobs and old mores and understandings and racial undertones will come out. It's just like a few years ago when the economy was bad, a lot of people were, were blaming immigrants for taking their jobs. So this has happened throughout history. Usually when there's riots and racial strife, it usually is during bad economic times. And those that, you know, we can say white folks will, will lash out and, and then there'll be a retaliation and all that kind of stuff. Although they faced discrimination, many blacks benefited from the jobs that helped out the war effort. So you can point to the race riots, you can point out to the discrimination. However, the fact is, African Americans leaving the Jim Crow South and the poverty of farming as a sharecropper and coming to the north and having the opportunity to work in these factories that definitely did benefit. You can look at the south side of Chicago. It's going to become a, a booming, booming, booming um, area of, of African-American professionals. Um, same thing in Harlem. Um, the Harlem section of New York City is going to explode in the 1920s, 30s, 40s for a good amount of time of intellectuals, writers, um, entrepreneurs. So there's going to be exceptions to the rule, lack of a better term, 
and other parts. And it is an improvement for African Americans compared to where they were at at the time. Was it perfect? Absolutely not. But it was an improvement. Mexican Americans moved from farms to city to work in factories also because of the industrial output for the war. The question is, will that sustain after the war? We're going to see there's going to be some issues. 100,000 Mexicans came to the U.S. between 1917 and 1920 to fill those jobs. We have 4 million men enlisted in the Army. Well, there's going to be jobs. African Americans can fill in those jobs, and then Mexicans can come over the border and fill those jobs too. Home on the war front. Excuse me. Home on the war front. That made sense. War on the home front. That, that makes more sense. Uh, women's voting rights. The National American Women's Suffrage Association, NAWSA, will become very strong. One of their leaders was Carrie Chapman Catt. She supported the war effort in the hopes to gain suffrage. And what that means is, look, the war effort's going to show that women are more than capable to do the same, if not more, than what men can do. So therefore, after the war, it's going to be impossible to continue to deny women the right to vote. They can run everything when the men are off the war. But for some reason, when they all come back, they can't do that anymore. Can't have the same political rights. That's what she was hoping. And guys, we're going to see that World War One and the, where women took the roles of men in a lot of positions, head of household for the family, working in um, the men's world, they proved that they could do it. It's going to make it almost impossible, absolutely impossible, to um, resist women's suffrage after World War One. So. Carrie Chapman Cat's hopes were definitely, definitely good ones and effective. The National Women's Party, or the NWP, led by Alice Paul, they picketed the White House and went on a hunger strike. So you have two groups. You have the NAWSA that's kind of mainstream. They're kind of calm. They're saying, look, we're going we're gonna to play to people's sensibilities that we're doing well during the war effort. So, and we're helping out the war, but just as much as men, people are going to support us. Well, Alice Paul is going to go on a hunger strike and picket and protest and be much more combative. So you have two groups looking for the same outcome, but two different tactics. Wilson supported female suffrage. Yeah, eventually. Um, he kind of didn't. He did when it became impossible for him not to. And in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified. It took Wilson a while. I will say, and again, I could care less who, more Republicans pushed women's suffrage because the states where women's suffrage already happened were in states like Wyoming, western states that were controlled by Republicans. They supported it very heavily. And it makes sense because women, very with the first 10 or 12 years that they're voting, are going to overwhelmingly support Republican candidates. Women did equate the Democrat Party, Democratic, excuse me, the Democratic Party, with the party of the South, Jim Crow South, segregationists. Not saying it's right, but that's where it was. It's going to take some time. Um, for the Democrats to recover from that and be able to do well with the female vote. They will in the 1930s uh, after the bubble burst and the onset of the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt. Okay, But Wilson supported uh, female suffrage at the end, after the pressure. He didn't right away. So I don't want you to be misled by that. So Wilson's peace delegation when he goes to Versailles or goes to Paris and goes to Europe to be part of this peace process a lot of high hopes eventually it's going to fall out to be a catastrophe because Wilson is going to make mistakes even before he leaves let's look at Wilson's 14 points then we'll look at what he decides to do when he sends a delegation um, to uh, Paris um, to try to end this war first first 
These are Wilson's plans for post-World War I, and we'll look at it more in depth. And the 14 points, in, in essence, called for open diplomacy between nations, reduction of arms, particularly navies, free trade among countries, trying to get rid of tariffs and barriers, sovereignty, okay, also this idea of self-determination that these former colonial people that lived in colonies would be able to govern themselves. And Article 10 called for the creation of the League of Nations. It was drastically different than Washington's farewell address. It was to definitely be involved in Europe and be involved in the rest of the world. Wilsonianism is much different than Washingtonianism or a complete, complete change in American foreign policy going forward after this experience. American foreign policy previous to this proposal would be to back off and let Europe deal with Europe and the United States take a back seat and just keep on making money. Wilson's vision was not that whatsoever. It was completely, completely different. And you could say it was even radical. I don't mean, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it was just, for Americans, it was different. Okay? So what were the fate of Wilson's ideas? First, Russia and Germany were excluded from the peace conference at Versailles. Okay? How are you going to impose the terms of a surrender or the terms of a peace? And two of the major nations that were involved in the start of this whole thing were excluded from the process. That within itself means that peace is being dictated to the Germans in particular and even to the Russians. We're going to see both of these countries are going to emerge as major, major problems to the so-called free world. I say so-called because back then you don't know what it was going to be. Okay? And Versailles and their exclusion from it is... A good start to this. I'm not blaming anybody for anything, but it wasn't really that smart. That's my opinion. Germany will be punished severely. They will be blamed for the cause of the war. Let that settle in. Did Germany cause World War I? Anybody that looks at what happened, anyone with a brain that wants to be fair will say absolutely not. They didn't start it. Were they part of it? Of course, but were they solely responsible for the start of World War I? Absolutely not. It's called the War Guilt Clause. Now let me tell you something about Wilson. He shows up there with his 14 points. He comes to Paris. He's treated like a god. I, I am not exaggerating. They had parades for him, the people in Paris, and they looked at him like look at this American hero Woodrow Wilson is going to come and make the world a better place I mean French people had portraits of Woodrow Wilson in their homes they literally almost worshipped the guy when he came to Europe he saved Europe he saved the world from the Germans he saved France from the Germans because those American boys and all the stuff that came from the United States to help win the war but here's Wilson's problem he's being delusional he thinks he's going to be able to dictate a peace. Now, mind you, this is the United States coming to the big stage for the first time. How many of you think that the British and the French are going to let the American president, who's never been on that stage any time before, dictate to them what the terms of the peace is going to be or what the post-world, excuse me, post-war world is going to be? I don't think anybody would raise your hand. They're like, yeah, okay. The British and French already decided what they were going to do with the colonies in the Middle East, in Asia. They already decided what they were going to do, particularly the Middle East, because that's the old Ottoman Empire. Okay, What are you going to do with the area of Syria? What are you going to do with the area of Transjordan and Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula? What are you going to do with that land in between Persia, which is today Iran, and north up to Turkey? What are you going to do with that? There was no name to that yet. Eventually it's going to be called Iraq. What are you going to do with that? Well, the, the French and the British were the main powers there. They always were. They had colonies there. They had colonial interests there. 
Do you think they're going to let Woodrow Wilson dictate what's going to happen there? Absolutely not. They have strategic concerns and interests there. So they already carve up the Middle East before Wilson even gets there. Wilson thinks that he's going to be able to do otherwise. The other mistake Wilson makes, he shows up. He doesn't bring any Republicans with him, just Democrats, just his own party. He was a fiercely partisan president. Now, if you know the Senate, you need Senate approval to, to ratify any treaty. It's called two-thirds. And at that time, the Republicans were either two sh seats short of a majority or had a two-seat majority. It doesn't matter. He needed Republican votes to have that treaty ratified. He invited none, not one. Politically, on the domestic side, a major mistake. Just like internationally, his mistake, he's thinking that Britain and France were going to have the terms of the Middle East dictated to them. Okay? So this is why this is catastrophic. Okay? Because Wilson made some big mistakes. A lot of critics will say that this whole ego thing went to his head at the end of the war. Maybe that's true. I, I don't know. But I do know, if I were president, God help us all, okay? That won't happen. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I, first of all, wouldn't be naive to what the other powers would try to do, especially when they've been on the top of the world stage forever. Secondly, if I'm Wilson, I'm a Democrat, you bet I'm bringing Republicans with me because I need that treaty to be ratified. Wilson actually thought he was going to be able to go around the country and force the Republicans to support it. Not didn't work that way. So Congress will reject the treaty. There were some irreconcilables. These are people opposed to the treaty due to foreign affairs. And their biggest problem was they believed the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations in particular took away Americans' constitutional right to their own sovereignty. So remember, a treaty to the Constitution, has the force of law. So, if you make a treaty of the League of Nations, you could potentially, I'm not saying I agree with them, but potentially be giving up your nation's sovereignty to a foreign power or some other entity. Okay? These are the irreconcilables. Also, some of these irreconcilables understood that to blame Germany for this war was catastrophic and dangerous. Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts despised Article 10. He said it would limit Congress's war-making powers and their sovereignty. That would be the League of Nations. That the United States must not subdue their war power decisions as a Congress to some group of folks talking somewhere in a building. That's the way he didn't say it that way, but the United States Congress declares war. They have that power. And taking war-making powers away from Congress, according to Henry Cabot Lodge, would be irresponsible and dangerous. Ultimately, the United States did not ratify the Treaty of Versailles. Wilson is going to try to go around the country pushing for it, and unfortunately for him, he has a massive, massive stroke that debilitates him for the rest of his presidency. And now stuff is coming out with uh, revised history. We think that his wife, Edith, was running the country, which we didn't have a 25th Amendment back then where, you know, the cabinet can come around and say, hey, you know, the, pe the president's not in good shape uh, mentally or physically. Uh, we need to um, remove him and bring in uh, the vice president or somebody else. We didn't have that. Someday the truth will come out one way or another. But they covered up the fact how debilitated he was. He didn't do any public appearances after the stroke. Um, when people would come to see him, it would be very short. It would be in a darkened room so they couldn't see the fact that he was in a state of paralysis from the stroke. Um you could say, I'm not going to say it, but people say this was a conspiracy. Um, that's enough of that. But ultimately, I think, in my opinion, 
even if he didn't have that stroke, the Treaty of Versailles would not have passed. He doomed it from the start by not bringing the Republicans in to be part of it. He should have compromised this and have everybody involved in this, both parties, after such a, a war that was so devastating and so monumental to its time in history. To be partisan on that, at the outset of that, during the peace process, to me was a huge, huge mistake. So, so a quick recap. Arguments over overseas expansion. We look at Mayan and the power of naval, the power of naval power sh ships, how important it is to have a strong navy to support and protect overseas expansion for your economy. You need to have docking stations to be able to fuel your ships, so that means you need territory. The only way you're going to get that territory or those docking rights is through a strong navy. If you don't have it, it's not going to happen. That is Mayan's thesis. It's going to be extremely influential, and I would argue for its time, probably right if that's what the United States wanted to do. It wasn't like it was just a theory. It actually worked in practice for him. Now, you can argue is it right or wrong, but overall, in terms of his accuracy, for its time, Mayan was on to something. This debate over the Philippines and expansion. It's not just going to have implications for then. It has implications to this day on how the United States conducts itself after it defeats or takes a territory. What do we do with that? Do we take it and annex it and occupy it? No. What we try to do is try to have it in a condition where it's taken over by people that would be friendly to us. Now, we can argue with that 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 isn't good either, but I'm not going to go there right now. But the way we deal with expansion the way we not even expansion we deal with defeating folks on their territory or taking over territory and how we deal with it definitely comes from this negative experience in the philippines where anti-imperialists were extremely critical and where a couple thousand american soldiers died with guerrilla warfare with the filipinos and looking at the injustice of that because the americans were just doing what the spanish were doing basically if not worse the Roosevelt Corollary, that means the expansion of the Monroe Doctrine, to say it doesn't just stay out. We're the police power, and in the interests of Latin America are our interests, and we have the right to intervene. Reasons for the U.S. entrance into World War I. One was economic. Secondly, we were much closer to the Allies, particularly the British. Um, we're trying to trade were secretly trying to help the British, by the way. Um, and the Germans, you know, they're trying to protect themselves. They're being blockaded and stopped out. Of course they're going to take out any ships. They're going to help their enemy. So that brings us into the war. Back up, though, with the Roosevelt Corollary. Don't forget, dollar diplomacy under Taft. We'll go over in class. I'll give you a, thing, a chart we're going to look at. And then missionary diplomacy under Wilson. You've got to understand that foreign policy had some different differing of objectives and what you can see today our foreign policy has facets that are territorial which is close to the United States that goes with the well, Roosevelt Corollary we're not comfortable whenever any powers try to come close to us and operate we also have economic interests throughout the world and that could be a reason for the United States to intervene as economic interests like oil like water like resources um, that kind of thing and then third, missionary diplomacy. There are reasons the United States have gone to war in the 20th and, I would argue, in the 21st century because of our concerns of a regime or whoever and how they're treating their people and how they are bad actors in regions. The Iraq War comes to mind. That's more missionary. Now, some people say, oh, it's really about oil. I don't know. I think there's an argument to be made that isn't necessarily the case since the United States did not get one drop of Iraqi oil from that second invasion. I understand the argument, but the United States didn't get a drop of oil. You could say, well, oil prices were better. Well, not really. Actually, oil prices went through the roof. So, again, if you look at these three aspects, big stick diplomacy in our hemisphere or close to us would be heavy-handed with our neighbors. That still happens. Secondly, 
economic interest, dollar diplomacy, that's still part of our foreign policy, and then missionary and moral diplomacy. Again, democracy, what's right for people, we're still there too. So those three aspects are still within our foreign policy calculations today. The Creel Committee, the Committee on Public Information that put together propaganda in visual in those four-minute speeches, okay, there's a lot more to it than what I discussed. A lot of this, um, a lot of the, the, the images were anti-German, the Kaiser, okay, um, made them look in a bad light. That had some negative effects for German Americans. There was a lot of suspicion of German Americans during World War I. Uh, the Creel, that's why they came with the Sedition Act, just to try to quiet people that were against the war looking more towards Germans and not having, um, they were afraid, particularly in, the, in uh, middle America where a lot of your anti-war operations were, it so happened to be where most of your German Americans were. So when you look at propaganda in World War One, you can look at some of the stuff and it can be a little bit unsettling, let's just say that. War is tough. And what you need to do during war, just like Abraham Lincoln with a suspended habeas corpus for folks in southern Ohio and Kentucky and Maryland and um, Virginia and West Virginia, excuse me, in those areas. Um, yeah, it's a little scary when the government throws you in jail, doesn't tell you why. So war makes things a little bit sketchy. But um, there was a lot that went on uh, during World War One. We're going to look at a little more of that class. Uh, the great migration of African Americans from the Jim Crow south or from the south to the northern cities particularly for economic opportunities and industrial um, capacity uh, because of the 4 million men that were enlisted in the armed forces to a lot more job opportunities. So because the industrial output was even more critical for the war effort, not just for the United States, but for all the allies. So the Great Migration is going to be a big improvement for many African Americans, albeit with some challenges, riots after the war, um, Let's just say a rebirth of segregation and discrimination in the North. It's very easy to say there wasn't a lot of, you know, discrimination against African Americans after the Civil War in the North. You know why? Because the vast majority of African Americans lived in the South. Well, when African Americans started moving into the North and started uh, competing for jobs in the job market, and unfortunately, you get to see the ugliness out of everyone when it comes to economic security. Some of the ugly ugliness of people come out. I'll leave it at that. You have uh, Schenck versus the United States which um, supported uh, all of these um, supported the Sedition Act of 1918 saying that it was constitutional. Well, if you're going to be jailed for criticizing a war effort I, I, I don't know. I see this as a violation of the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court said, no, well, no, not really, because it could incite rebellion and, you know, bring the war from within. Uh, I disagree with the decision, but I understand where they're coming from. Um, and uh, I don't know. Like you know, when it comes to civil, liber civil liberties, um, I am usually f I'm the civil libertarian on this, so I, wouldn't, I don't necessarily agree with Schenck versus the United States. You need to know the... 14 points of the Treaty of Versailles. We're going to look at it more in depth. We have them in our documents. Um, so we'll take a little bit more on that. And that's pretty much it. And just knowing with uh, the Treaty of Versailles on how it was a catastrophe. And again, I put it at the feet of Wilson. He was, he was trying to go too far. He was not practical about his goals of going to Paris and then Versailles and thinking he could, lack of a better term, guys, jam the Treaty of Versailles down the throat of the United States Senate was not realistic. Not with the numbers that were there. He needed a two-thirds vote. And I'm pretty sure they were either two seats short of a majority of the Republicans or had a slim majority, either one of the two. Either or. There's no way they were going to get it passed if he tried to jam it down the throat, which he tried to do, which didn't get passed, which never got passed. And that is it for Chapter 21. If you have questions, ask them in class, okay? I'm not covering everything in here. I don't pretend I am. So if you have specific questions from the reading, 
or any of the readings on any of this that you don't understand or think we need to discuss, please bring that up in class. That's what this class time is for, to go more in depth than where we are. If you think there's something I really need to go over and do another video on, I'll do it. Okay, so um, let me know where you have the questions, and if I see the need, I'll get more materials there for you. Thanks for watching, and until next time.